ان الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصهما فلا يضر الا نفسه هو الذي ارسل رسوله بالهدى والدين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون اما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين يا رب وقال عز وجل يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون وقال عز وجل يا ايها الذين امنوا ان من ازواجكم واولادكم عدو لكم فاحذروهم وان تعفوا وتصفحوا وتغفروا فان الله غفور رحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين يا رب اللهم الحمني رشدي وعيني من شر نفسي So today I want to talk about relationships and particularly uh relationships between it can the rules I will talk about can generally apply to any relationship but I want to talk about the sunnah of fighting or arguing or disputing with between husband and wife how the prophet did it and what are some of the rules we can extract from the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in regards to having a dispute with your wife like regularly you know and by the way this is an interesting subject that i will share with you <coughs> that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to have disputes with his wife this is on record and uh, they used to sometimes have disputes with him and sometimes he had disputes with them and there was a very interesting dynamic that was going on in the household of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in regards to these uh, disagreements that took place between him and his wife some of them are mentioned in the quran which we will go over today and how the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the quran helped us to under what the uh, quran helps us to understand and how to resolve these disputes and uh, so just a few basic things uh i'm not feeling that good today so i may just be monotone mostly so anyway the for example there is a hadith it's in sahih bukhari that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was fighting with aisha some dispute and over here is a very important principle that i'm about to give you about the deen the prophet was arguing with his wife and in this in the in the in the argument the prophet said to aisha there was a proverb an idiom in the arabic language which meant may your hands be cut, may your hands be broken so the prophet says to her in the argument may your hands be broken whatever she was saying so he said may may your hands be broken meaning i'm not pleased with what you're requesting me or asking me and you know marital relationships has a lot to do with a few components one of them is expectations but the prophet said this and then uh, aisha radiyallahu anha she starts looking at her hands well the prophet he said may your hands be broken so that means that i should start looking at my hands when my hands will be broken Now does this mean that it is the sunnah of the prophet to fight with your wife? Or does this mean that it is sunnah of the prophet to say to your wife that may your hands be broken? So anyway, this is a question I just want you to understand some fundamentals of the deen because not everything the prophet did is in, is part of the deen and part of the sunnah. For example, just what he ate on Mondays. Do we have a list? Or what he ate on Tuesdays? Do we have a menu his menu? He used to he did this on this day and he ate this on this day no we have a general idea a general idea those foods that were somehow related with the deen became part of the sunnah 
those foods that were part of that culture, part of that environment, that were eaten every day, like for example, dates became part of the deen because it was used after after an ibadat or in other aspects of that, but other foods were not. Honey was included in Quran, for example. Same way the Prophet used to eat, for example, he, he liked pumpkin, he liked squash, he liked so many different foods. But they're foods that they ate at that time the Prophet would have eaten, we don't know about. But we know about some of the things that he liked and some of the things that he ate. <clears throat> the point I'm trying to make here is that there is a way to extrapolate what is the sunnah. And this is the essential difference between sunnah and hadith. Hadith is a report that such and such thing happened. From the hadith you extract what is the sunnah, what is the way of the Prophet, what do you learn about the Prophet to follow his way. And not just follow his way, but copy. You know copy and paste, you do it on computers. So the sunnah is follow. But ittiba, kul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, say if you love Allah, fattabi'uni, then do, my ittiba is copy and paste. So there's different words used in Quran about the Prophet. For example, atiullah wa ati rasul, obey Allah and his messenger. This is, you have to do this. When he gave you, take it. When he stops you from, you stay away from it. So, uh, fear Allah and don't advance before Allah and His Messenger. So there's another term used. One of the terms used, If you really love Allah, then copy the Prophet. This is the word. Ittiba means to copy the Prophet Because love has to do with copying, emulating, making yourself exactly like the mirror image of the Prophet Anyway, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us some rules. So here the Prophet was arguing with his wife and he said, may your hands be broken. And she starts looking at her hands and she's waiting. She says, I'm waiting to see when, she says to the Prophet, I'm waiting to see when my hands will be broken. And the Prophet starts smiling. So what do we learn from this? Number one and the most important thing and the most biggest mistake people make in marriages or in any relationship when there's a conflict is we don't fight fair. Meaning we try to win. It becomes about winning rather than if, if, if your spouse or you say something, they shouldn't try to have, you know, if, if somebody jabs you one, you don't want to jab them two. You want to jab them back one. So that you can keep the fight fair. I mean, because you will fight with your spouse. Everyone will fight with someone. Siblings will fight with each other. Parents will fight with each other. But whoever you're fighting with, whoever you're in a disagreement with, you should always try to not never go below the belt. It's not a boxing match where you, in, in the end of 12 rounds, somebody has to win. So look at here. The Prophet is arguing with uh, Aisha, and then she's looking at it. It became like almost like the Prophet started smiling at the end, right? Why? Because they weren't insulting each other. They weren't trying to put each other down. So it was easy to uh, diffuse the situation into normalcy, into a situation that is normal. And you know, this is <coughs> uh, very important. Uh, it's not the amount of times you fight in a relationship that makes a bad relationship. What studies have shown is the amount of time you insult the others that makes a bad relationship. So if you fight a lot of times with your spouse, that just means that there's intensity. It may be a good thing, maybe a bad thing. But when you start coming on insults and trying to bring the other person down because it generally becomes about who's going to win. And we know la darra wa la darra. This is a general rule within Islam. There's no harming. So when you argue with your wife, don't argue, or your wife argues with the husband, don't make it about winning. Our, the argument between husband and wife is not about winning. It's to come to a resolution. And if you're always focused on winning, 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 which is particularly the hierarchical mindset of the male is always looking at, you know, the, the win. And uh, so try not to focus on winning the argument, but uh, try to keep the fight fair, meaning don't go below the belt. In another narration, for example, when the Prophet you know, 
he had a conflict uh, with Aisha again, radiallahu anha. You know, he's arguing with her, and then he says to her, okay, choose, choose a judge between us. Who will arbitrate between, between us? The Prophet says, let Umar bin Khattab arbitrate between us. And she says, no, not him. And then, she, then the Prophet says, okay, what about your father, Abu Bakr? And then she says, yes. So, you know, here is another example of uh, you're fighting fair and you're fighting to resolve the situation, but you're not fighting to win the situation necessarily. In a husband-wife situation or any relationship, like it generally, it is not important to win the situation. Now, I want to share with you, uh, when it comes to couple, uh, family uh, therapy, counseling, there's one verse of the Quran that is extremely powerful. I mean, it just sums up so many things in it that uh, it sums up so many lessons in this one verse uh, that it is amazing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I'll be going over a few of the verses of the Quran. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <clears throat> and by the way, about, uh, and the Prophet had this attitude, which I talked about at the <coughs> Hajj occasion that we had also, but I'll mention it here again. And that is that, you know, if you see two kids playing, <coughs> and the kids, they start fighting, and then five minutes later, they're playing again. Why? Why, why did they, I mean, they were fighting, and now five minutes later, they're playing. Why? Because they choose happiness over who's right. Kids aren't that concerned with who's right. So the issue drops, you know. Uh, the issue drops, and you choose happiness over who's right. Basically, that's what happens. What usually gets people stuck is that I'm right, she's wrong, or he's wrong, he's wrong, I'm right. So you, we have to come out of that uh, cycle of thinking that who's right and who's wrong, and choose happiness. And this was the way, essentially the way of the Prophet ﷺ, that unless it contradicted Islam, unless it was a barrier to Islam in some way, he was always willing to compromise the Prophet ﷺ, always willing to resolve the pro problems. And this was his way in general. Uh, like his general attitude with everyone. Again, there's too many stories on that that we can take up one day just on that, but I want to go over this verse to begin with and then two other verses of the Quran. And uh, uh, let me go over this verse and then I'm going to explain something else that's very, very interesting in the dynamics of relationships, which I'll come to inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhaladzina amanu, O you people who believe, or you people who claim to believe. Ya ayyuhaladzina amanu, inna min azwajikum wa awladikum adu'ul lakum. So on the one side, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, O you people who believe, indeed in your wives and your children, there are your enemies. Now notice the extreme here. Now this ayah is generally interpreted one way. I'm going to give you a new way to understand this ayah. So you can appreciate both sides. One general way that is common that Muslims are aware of, in the, that indeed in your, in your wives and your children are your enemies, meaning potentially they're your enemies. They can potentially put you on the wrong track. They can potentially make you make wrong choices. And remember, the essence of Islam is all about choices you make. Fatiha, what do we say? Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem, choices. They help guide us to make the right choices in life. That's what you're praying for every day. It is so important that we make right choices. Right? That's what it all, your life is your choices. Everything from what coffee you're going to drink to, who you're going to marry to, what you'll do in business, everything is a choice that you, you make a decision about the choices in your life. So Allah subhanahu wa says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, inna min azwajikum wa awladikum adu'un lakum fahzaruhum, so beware of them. So indeed there are enemies in your wives and your children, but beware of them. So it sounds like this verse is saying that, you know, be careful, be on alert. But because it's a house, and you can't make your house into a war zone. Sometimes what happens is, if someone is religious in the house, and the other people are not so religious, the house sometimes becomes like a war zone, because you're trying to change the rules. And... But Allah is saying, Allah is telling us here 
that these are your wives and your children. They are your enemies, beware of them. Meaning, this is one way to take it. The other way is, they are your enemies, beware of them. Meaning, they are your enemies, they will be your enemies on the day of judgment. Meaning, they will witness against you the wrongs that you did. This is the other way to take the ayah. So, in terms of responsibility, don't make wrong choices because you love them. On the other side, don't make wrong choices uh, against them, meaning against their rights and what they deserve. So both of these, both ways of looking at this ayah is correct. Then over here is the main thing. If you take the ayah to mean that on one side Allah is saying, look, be careful, don't make any mistakes, because they're potentially your enemy and you will, I mean, after all, what does, especially the man do? He spends his whole life taking care of his family. So this is where uh, a lot of people can tend to make mistakes. So Allah says three things then. But in this situation where it is so intense that you want to stay on the straight path, but maybe other people are going to help make you deviate, Allah says three things. وَإِن تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَهُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا تَعْفُوا Let go. They're your enemies, but let go. Meaning, you know, اِعْفَلُّهَا The Prophet said, let the beard grow. اِعْفُوا means let go, let go. You don't have to make every issue that you find wrong into a fight. It's not necessary. You know, some people, they find it very hard to let go. Everything they find, they have to nitpick. They have to nitpick. They have to nitpick. Every single little thing. Let it go. Who cares? In that sense. Let it go. in ta'fu. Even if they're doing something wrong. Allah says, in ta'fu. Wa tasfahu. You know tasfahu? Safha. You know safha? You have a waraqa. Waraqa is a page, front and back. One side of the page is called safha. The other side is also called safha. The page is called waraqa. Wa in ta'fu, if you just let go, wa tasfahu, you give, you make safha. You turn the page. Urdu me kete, dekhi go na dekhi karna. You, your son, you look at your son. Uh, he's doing something wrong. He knows you saw him do something wrong, but you pretend like you didn't see it. Letting, let go. You don't have to make a fight of every issue. It's not always about who's right and who's wrong. And number two, let him know you know, but don't make it an issue. What in ta'fu, what tasfahu. What ta'lufiru. Ghafara, maghfar, is a helmet you wear. You know when you go to ba battle, you wear a helmet. So if somebody hits you in the hel helmet, you don't get hurt. This is ghafara. Ghafara means to cover. To cover in such a way that you won't be hurt. Wa in ta'fu, let it go. Wa tasfahu, turn your turn the other way, as if you didn't see it. Wa firu, and forgive is the general meaning, but meaning cover up their faults. Generally, a very good example of this is when the mother says to the children, basically she's covering up the children's faults. Oh, if you if you do this again, I'm going to tell dad, right? I'm covering it up for you because that's the ultimate threat. The ultimate threat is, I'm going to tell daddy, right? Because they always deal with mommy, but to deal with daddy, you know, that's, 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 that's the ultimate, that should be the ultimate threat. Anyway, uh, so, And if you forgive them, And Allah will also, is most kind, He'll be forgiving you. So on the one side, Quran lays such a strong emphasis they're your enemies. Beware of them. Be careful of them. They're going to challenge you to maybe make, make mistakes. But on the other side, to balance it, وَإِن تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَوُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا Three for one. Over there, أُدُوبُوا لَكُمْ فَحْزَرُوا One. They're your enemies. Be careful. Over here is, وَإِن تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَوُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ رَحِيمُ Indeed, Allah is غَفُورُ رَحِيمُ Now, what happens is, in relationships, now please listen to what I'm about to say because you will find yourself and your spouse in one of these two categories. Generally when there is a conflict, a spousal conflict, one is the pursuer and one is the one who withdraws. According to the uh, author of Men Are From Mars, Women From Venus, uh, he says the women are the pursuers and men are the withdrawers. Because Men find themselves, and sisters can listen to this, it's interesting. Men find themselves in, in an interesting situation. Women want to communicate, they pursue. 
to communicate. But the guy feels, if I say what's really in my heart, it's going to create more conflict. So he withdraws. He tries not to make the argument. The way the guy looks at it is the argument will get bigger than it needs to be. So I'd rather just not talk about it and move on. The wife wants to communicate. So generally, in relationships, the wife is always pursuing the husband, and the husband's trying to withdraw. Now, in this dynamics of who is pursuing who, because sometimes it can be the opposite. Sometimes it can be the man who is pursuing the wife, and she is withdrawing, and he is not. He's pursuing. And this is an interesting phenomenon that always, in relationships, we always fight, find ourselves in a, in a, in a cat-mouse situation where the cat's, you know, one is the cat, the other is the mouse. You're chasing after someone, and someone's trying to run to the other side, run away from you. And this is an interesting dynamic, which, inshallah, I will talk about in my... Second khutbah, aqulu qawli hadha, astaghfirullah li wa lakum, wa li sa'ad al-muslimin wa al-muslimin. So, inna alhamdulillahi, na'maduhu, nasta'inuhu, nasta'afiruhu, wa nashadu an la ilaha illa Allah, wahdahu la sharika lah, wa nashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Time is running out. And since I'm not feeling good, I'm going to try to really finish on time today. And uh, so I was saying in every relationship, one of the spouses is the pursuer, and one of the spouses is the one who withdraws, who tries to stay away from the conflict. And one of the spouses wants to communicate, or as the other person would see it, wants to create the conflict. So the wife, usually, most of the time, it's the wife that pursues the husband, because she wants to communicate. And the husband doesn't want to exasper exasperate the situation, so he wants to withdraw himself from the conflict, because if he says what's in his heart, it will exasperate the situation. I'm sure many brothers and sisters have found themselves in this situation. But uh, now, uh, what does the Quran deal, how does the Quran deal with this? Some examples of this. Now, the Quran gives two examples of this. Surah Al-Tahrim and Surah Al-Talaq. These are twin surahs, by the way. Surah Al-Tahrim and Surah Al-Talaq. Surah Al-Talaq and Surah Al-Tahrim. And uh, Surah Al-Talaq comes first, and then Surah Al-Tahrim. And these talk about two opposite sides. These two opposite. The withdrawing and the pursuing. And uh, two opposite parts or aspects of a relationship. So I'm only going to go over the first few verses of both of them, tell you the story behind them, and then we will... Uh, try to see how this all plays together. Um, the other thing that I want to, uh, want to mention is, okay, let me, I'll mention that in a second. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet, I'm going to go over this very lightly, I'm not going to go over this ayah in detail, but just mention this, that this is, was the nature of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O Prophet of Allah, إِذَا تَلَّقْتُمُ nisa. So when you d decide to give talaq to your women, meaning to the wives of the Prophet. This is an occasion where the Prophet had fallen into conflict, which I, I had talked about at one other khutbah I think I gave here. Right now, I only want to mention that in the case of the Prophet, most of the time, he was the one that withdrew himself. It was in, even in the beginning when the revelation came, he was withdrawing himself to the cave, if you remember. So the Prophet wasallam, he had more of a nature of, instead of pursuing other people and uh, he, when there would be conflict, especially in his household, he would be the one that withdraws. This was specific to him, but every human being is different. Then in the next surah, which is Surah Tahrim, the next surah, which is the twin surah of this surah, this is an interesting uh, situation, and you all have heard of this, but I want to put it in the context of the one who withdraws and the one who pursues. So you know that, uh, again, I mentioned the wives of the Prophet, they had an interesting dynamic. The younger wives, they got along together. The older wives, they got along together. So there was a type of grouping, you know, cliques. So the wives of the Prophet, they had their own cliques amongst the wives of the Prophet wasallam. So Aisha, Zainab, Hafsa, for example, they got along because they were younger. And uh, Umm Salma and the others, they were older, so they had their own cliques. So now here was a situation, the Prophet used to go to the house of one of his wives, she used to make him honey. Aisha felt jealous. She was very jealous. By the way, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. Even one day, what happened is, 
one of the wives of the Prophet brought food for the Prophet and his guests, but they were in the house of Aisha. And uh, so here is one wife, she's bringing food, and, uh, and so Aisha sees, oh, this wife is bringing food to my house while guests are at my house, you know, the, crossing the limits. So she takes the food and throws it on the ground, breaks the food, right? And the Prophet smiles and says, your mother, meaning Aisha is the mother of the believers, she is upset, meaning it was the end of that, right? No insults, just patience, and just resolving the situation, it's over, you know? So over here the situation was that the Prophet he went to, uh, the, he, went, he had honey, and then I'm making a long story short. He went, and you all know about this, but I want to put it in the perspective of the, the pursuer and the withdrawing. So uh, the Prophet goes to Aisha's house and she's like, what is that smell that you have, you know? And, uh, and then Zainab and then Hafsa, they all say, so the Prophet's like, wow, okay. The Prophet did not like bad smell at all, okay? The one thing for even which the Prophet says, there is no israf, meaning there, you can buy it as much as you want, there's no israf. There's no sin for too much, buying it too much is uh, the good smell, right? If you buy too much of good smell, there's no sin on you. So if you go buy the most expensive cologne, right, to put on you, uh, there's no sin on you to do that. It's, it won't be called Israf if, if you did that. So the Prophet liked good smells, and for him to hear that, oh, this doesn't smell good. So he immediately said, I swear by Allah, I will never have honey again, right? now. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses, and notice how Allah mentions this. Ya ayyuhal nabi, O Prophet of Allah, lima tuharrimu ma'ahal Allah? Why do you make haram which I have kept halal? Now the Prophet never said it's haram. He only said for him personal self that I won't have honey. But because then the ummah would have said, oh, the Prophet doesn't have honey. So the ummah would have made something haram upon itself, something that is halal. So, because of this reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this clear. Look, this is halal. لِمَا تُحَرِّمُ مَا أَحَلَّ اللَّهُ Why did he do this? تَبْتَغِي مَرْضَاتِ أَزْوَاجِكَ You did this to please your wives. You made something, you said, okay, I won't do this to please your wives. Allah says, وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ رَحِيمُ And Allah is غَفُورُ رَحِيمُ So again here, the Prophet's response, okay, I won't do this to make his wives happy. If uh, any time there's a situation of, of conflict, the Prophet would step back, so to say, and try to diffuse the situation in this way. Other things that I want to talk about is when uh, you are in a relationship, uh, try not to criticize your spouse more than one time a day. Okay? Uh, if you criticize your spouse more than one time a day, then, you know, it's like every criticism, you can call it advice. Don't give too much advice, either. One advice a day, one criticism a day, same thing. You know, you give too much advice, and you start bringing up history. Now, I know sisters tend to do that a lot, too, where they'll bring up the history of everything that's happened. Again, being part of fighting fair, fight, but fight fair. Don't bring up the past, because then you're not resolving the situation. Always stick with what you want to know. And the other thing is, uh, there's an interesting hadith of the Prophet about this, which, uh, again, I don't have time. But there is a very interesting hadith on this issue about uh, the wives. But I just want to mention a few things very quickly. And that is that um, always try to be accurate when you're in a spousal argument. Like, don't ever be like, oh, you never do this for me. You never did this for me. You never care for me, right? Like, this, because when you do that, when you are so generalized in your statement, it doesn't make your statement strong because it's, it's not accurate. And because it's not accurate, the other person you're trying to tell this to is going to immediately withdraw. That's not even true. And so you have disengaged them from an, a, a, a fruitful conversation by saying absolute generals like, you never did this for me or you never brought a gift for me, whatever it is, right? And it's not, it doesn't have to be only women, it can also be men who may feel that way at a particular given time. But the reality is that when you generalize and rather than be accurate, and it's very important, and that you see this in this, I mean, I, I can't, just so many examples. The very famous hadith in Sahih Bukhari that became a big controversial issue 
uh, with uh, Brother Javed Jamshed, if you remember that. That hadith, what was it? There was an I, st you know, when you talk about, generally we say, don't say I because it's the ego. But sometimes it's the opposite. We know when you say I, you're not blaming the other person. I feel this way. I feel this wasn't fair. I feel we should do this. Or I feel, when you're saying that, you're not blaming the other person, and it's actually a good and a humbling thing to say I, rather than you didn't do this, and you couldn't do this, or you should have done this, you say, I feel that we should have done this. And that helps to engage the partner in a conversation, rather. Like, for example, the hadith that I was mentioning, you know, again, what happened? Aisha says, "My, I have a headache. And the Prophet says, well, if you pass away, I will, you will be so lucky because I am the Prophet of Allah, and I will pray for your forgiveness. What's better than that? Right? That I will pray for your forgiveness. And the Prophet's, and she has a headache, so she's maybe, you know, frustrated. Uh, and so she says, oh, is that what you want? That I die and you go to your other wives? And the Prophet says, oh, I should drop it. This is that playground uh, example that I gave. Just choose to be happy. Drop it. So the Prophet says, drop it. Let's drop this. It, I really have a headache. And, and this was the dying days, actually. This was amongst the dying days of the Prophet wasallam. And one of the, this was how his actually death started was with this headache. This was the headache that started the, the process of his, uh, the, it started with his headache. Uh, and this was that time. So, you know, he said, oh, Aisha, drop it. It is, I am the one who really has. And according to a, another version, this one isn't saying Bukhari, but another version says, he says to Aisha, Aisha, your headache will be fine. It's my headache that's gonna, uh, gonna be the problem. So, so uh, when you are in a conflict with your spouse, don't give a lecture. Try to say what you want to say in three statements or less. In fact, the people, uh, the people that work on the purification of the heart say the exact same thing. They say, if you, can't admit, if you are talking to people, don't talk, just don't keep on going and going and talking and talking. Because they'll turn off. The other side will turn off. They're, you're not communicating. Try to make your point in less than three sentences and let them respond to your three sentences. If you're fighting with your wife, make this a rule. If your wife is fighting with you, let it be a rule. Keep the argument, meaning your point, your disagreement, your contention, your, your feelings are hurt. Whatever it is, three sentences or less. Or if your son's talking to you, or you're talking to your son, or your children. Son, I'm upset because of this. In three sentences, no lectures. Because lectures turn people off. It's not like they're sitting taking notes. They're not. They want to run away. Right? And then the next thing you find out that, you, because when is the relationship bad? A relationship is bad when you get the shortest possible answers. Yes, no, maybe, okay, all right, bye. That's not a relationship. You, you, to build a better relationship, try to keep your be criticism <coughs> three sentences or less. Uh, and uh, again, time is running out, so I will, inshallah, um, end over here for today. But uh, there's a lot of other things that we can learn from the seerah of the Prophet The Prophet spoke word, he spoke in a way that generally when he spoke normally, there are ahadiths when the Prophet gave khutbah, he was very, like a good orator, he spoke, spoke powerfully, people listened to him, and he had to be a good orator. Not only he was a good orator, but he said about himself, I'm the most eloquent speaker, I'm the best of the speakers. No one speaks better than I can speak, I'm the best. And that's when, and in fact, there's a subject that's very interesting where you compare the balagha of the sayings of the Prophet, the eloquence of the prophetic sayings, how beautifully the Prophet said things. I mean, again, I don't have time right now, but, and how the Qur'an's eloquence is different from the Prophet's eloquence. Meaning the Prophet's eloquence was, I, and I'm the most eloquent of you. But the Qur'an is even more eloquent, and you can tell anybody who has studied Hadith literature and then has studied Qur'an can tell that there are completely two different personalities that are talking. Um, again, uh, let's just do dua and pray. Uh, so, just to wrap up very quickly, main things, choose to be happy, fight. <laughs> If you're going to fight, fight fair, no insults, say your points in less than three sentences, 
if you are in your in your relationship, if somebody, if you are the pursuer, don't don't pursue so intensely that you cause the other person to run away completely. If you are the withdrawer in the relationship, don't withdraw so much that they can't communicate with you. So because this is this creates uh, you know more tension because it creates more anxiety and more stress. So ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإلا لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكون من الخاسرين. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا ذاب النار. اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا اللهم تجعل خلافة المسلمين في هذه الأرض. إنك أنت على كل شيء قدير. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد. اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم. وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد إن الله يعملك بالأدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله يذكركم فاستجب لكم فأقيموا الصلاة